So as early as the 1920s, the antitrust laws had been interpreted by the Supreme Court to uh, apply to labor monopsony. The puzzle is, you know, why there haven't been more cases. So, you know, that happened and that was it. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what is it? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. So... One of the privileges of being a professor, and uh, there are many, is that you get to see what smart graduate students produce in their dissertation. And this year, I happen to see two bright students going on the job market with a topic that until very recently was basically not analyzed and now has become uh, the hot topic for the year. And this topic is uh, labor market power. To what extent the stagnation of wages is the result of firms having market powers over workers and paying workers too little. At the same time, a colleague from the law school has just written a book called How Antitrust Fail Workers. And so we thought it was a good idea to invite my colleague from the law school to tell us the legal part. And then Bethany and I will discuss a bit the uh, nascent evidence on the topic and the challenges that this uh, nascent evidence is bringing to the table. I found this fascinating, just the whole notion that there was this entire area of study that hadn't really been looked at before. I always think it's interesting when there's a foundation of what we all believe, and in this case, that people just believed that concentration didn't affect labor markets. And, and I, it, for me, it was opening up this whole prism on the world because I think of antitrust in very conventional terms, which is, which is corporate power, but I never thought of it in terms of the power that a company could exert in the labor market. So Eric Posner is a a professor at the University of Chicago's Law School and where he is also the Kirkland and Ellis Distinguished Service Professor of Law. And his new book is How Antitrust Failed Workers. So Eric, I'd love to start with a definition and maybe some history. I was struck by somewhere in your writing where you noted that the word monopsony was not actually coined with the Sherman Act. And I was wondering if you could define both define it for this non-economist and also tell us how it came into being if it did not come into being with the Sherman Act. Sure. Yeah, the, the concept existed before it was coined in the 1930s. The, the word itself was coined by an economist named Joan Robinson, a, a British economist. Actually, one of the first big women economists, no? Uh, very influential. The word uh, means a single buyer as opposed to a monopolist, which means a single seller, a very big buyer with a lot of bargaining power, and that could be an employer as well as um, a, a company that's buying goods. Because an employer is buying labor from workers. So we can think of an employer. There's a long history of monopsony in this country, including, for example, company towns. Pullman near Chicago famously operated a company town. So you know, literally the people who lived in that town had no option but to work for Pullman, which manufactured uh, railroad cars. Now, it's not like they tried to bring an antitrust suit against Pullman and lost. They just never brought an antitrust suit. I don't think it would have occurred to them to do so. And there's a long history of people not bringing antitrust suits against large employers, which contrasts quite dramatically with a long history of people constantly bringing antitrust suits um, against sellers, monopolists like Standard Oil or Facebook or, or Google or, or, or whoever. As an economist, I, I have to intervene and say that the, the tricky part, both in the definition of monopoly and the definition of monopsony, is how you define the market. Now, this is complicated for the product market. It's even more complicated for the labor market because uh, clearly the only employer of PhD economists in Hyde Park is the University of Chicago. So the University of Chicago is monopsony in a very teeny tiny environment. Now, if you broaden it to include downtown, there are a lot more employers. And so the, the monopsony power disappears. So, and, uh, and of course, if you enlarge the set of potential players, not just PhD economists, but also other jobs, uh, clearly, even in Hyde Park, you don't have a monopsony. So it's a very important issue for the listener, how you define the define market. But one other thing that I found remarkable in your book, Eric, you go through the legal history of uh, the non-enforcement 
of monopsony in the United States. And even for somebody like me, who is quite skeptical about how well uh, antitrust has worked in the product market in the last 30 or 40 years, it is shocking how basically they're not even try. So can you g- describe to our listeners some of the most egregious cases? Because they are, they are really worth reading. I, I strongly encourage all uh, the listeners to do so because it's, it's eye-opening. Sure. Well, you know, the, the most egregious cases are the cases that are not broad. Uh, probably the most famous example, and, and maybe this is what, Luigi, you have in mind, the Silicon Valley nil poaching case. So in 2010, the Justice Department sued and settled with the big Silicon Valley firms that we're all familiar with, Google, Apple, uh, Adobe, Pixar. These um, huge software companies had agreed not to poach or hire away each other's software engineers. Now that's just straightforward collusion. If this were a lawsuit against sellers, you know, Ford, GM, and Chrysler, if Chrysler still exists, I guess it sort of does, if they agreed to divide up markets, they would sell their cars in different states. Not only would the consumers have a, you know, a great case against them, but the executives who agreed to this arrangement would go to jail. In the case of Silicon Valley, though, and this involved people like Steve Jobs, the Justice Department entered a settlement with them under which the only obligation on the part of the Silicon Valley tech titans was to agree never to enter into such an agreement again. I'm not even sure it was never. Uh, It may have been for five years or something like that. So there was literally, you know, no sanction in that case. And uh, there was a follow on uh, class action suit by the software engineers, and they settled for $400 million. So, you know, that's a, it's pretty amazing that Steve Jobs did not go to jail. I think part of the reason was that since there's a long history of non-enforcement of antitrust with respect to employers, the Justice Department probably thought it would be inappropriate to seek criminal sanctions. And, you know, a few years later, they did issue guidance to companies saying, you know, henceforth, we will bring criminal cases. And in fact, they have over the last uh, year or two. It was pretty amazing that these enormous companies which now everybody regards as you know very anti-competitive, um, even back then had engaged in what was a very explicit, illegal, uh, anti-competitive uh, agreement. I was more taken by the case of Leinani Desland with McDonald's, okay. where she was paid $12 an hour. Another franchise at McDonald's offered her $13.75 an hour, and then they withdrew the offer because they have an agreement not to poach between different McDonald's franchises. And the court sided with McDonald's. So if you are in a franchise, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're in a franchise, you cannot unionize, so you cannot fight the power of the employer through unions, but the, the, the employers can basically unionize against you. It seems like completely unfair and much more relevant for the middle class than the software engineer case, no? Yeah. I mean, each restaurant ag- agrees not to poach or hire away workers from another restaurant. That's, you know, probably, you know, pretty illegal. And uh, in fact, the franchises were all sued by state attorneys general and settled. They just dropped these clauses rather than fight. But there has been litigation now by the employees who are saying, you know, as a result of this, I'm underpaid. You know, I'm at McDonald's earning $12 an hour. Another place wants to hire me away and pay me $13 an hour. As a result of this no poach clause, I'm not hired away. I have to stay. In fact, in, in the Dayland case, the the plaintiff in, in question, she just quit McDonald's and went to work at um, uh, maybe Home Depot or some other place at, 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 an, at a lower wage. But it's also pretty complicated. And this gets back to the issue of what the market is. So if you get fired from McDonald's or you leave McDonald's, the no poach clause does not block you from going to work at Burger King or Wendy's. And so the question is, should the market be regarded as workers for McDonald's franchises or, let's say, workers for all fast food franchises or unskilled workers within a particular area like downtown Chicago or all of Chicago, depending on where people commute? Um, And and that's a a kind of a tricky issue. It, It can be resolved just through empirical study. You look at how people actually behave if their wages are reduced. Do they have the option to go to a competing franchise or don't they? But, but that can be complicated and, and raises you know, difficult empirical questions that have to be resolved. 
those questions are still open, but I think, you know, we'll see what happens in the long term. Are there any historical precedents? In other words, was there ever a time where labor market monopolies were were prosecuted? And so is there a historical precedent we can look to in cases like this? Or are these issues you're raising a modern phenomenon? So as early as the 1920s, the antitrust laws had been interpreted by the Supreme Court to uh, apply to labor monopsony. The puzzle is, you know, why there haven't been more cases. So, you know, that happened and that was it. Um, and then, you know, ever since then, there have been a few cases every once in a while. So it's a kind of a, a, a strange situation in law, because on the one hand, you ask if there's a precedent. Yes, there is. But on the other hand, we think of it as kind of a weak precedent. They're not, since there are not very many cases, it's hard for lawyers who represent workers to predict how courts will resolve various types of issues. And that d- d- discourages them from bringing the cases in the first place. Interesting. I was thinking about it as two graphs and, you know, they would look nothing alike, right? If you saw the graph of conventional antitrust cases brought and then the graph of these kind of cases that yeah. you might expect to see some sort of correlation in the patterns, but, or, 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 or not, but there's just, there's just nothing, right? There's no relationship there's between nothing. the two. Uh, it, you know, the total number of what I call labor side antitrust cases is, you know, trivial, whereas the total number of product side antitrust cases, you know, runs into the thousands. Now, over the last few years, the, there has been an increase in labor side antitrust uh, cases, probably as a result of some of this empirical research by economists. The, the problem has become uh, better known. And also, I think, as a result of the 2010 Silicon Valley case, which I think persuaded people in government that there, there might be a problem here. So uh, we, we, we're now, you know, the, 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 the line is going up now. And there's also a, some concern or many concerns about non-compete clauses apply to ordinary workers. When a firm loses a, a worker because uh, it's attracted to a, for a better wage, they update generally the, the, the wages of all the other workers to retain them. If one person is prevented to receive an offer from a non-compete, then the entire firm has less of a wage dynamic, no? Yeah, no, absolutely. I believe that 40% of workers have at some point been party to a non-compete, I think 20% at any given time, and as many as 10% of of people who don't have college educations, low-income workers. On the one hand, people who defend non-competes say that without them, employers are not going to trust their workers with secrets and are not going to train them. But on the other side, as you say, uh, Luigi, if uh, a worker is banned by a non-compete, which could mean that you know after you're fired or quit, you can't work in the industry for a year or two, they're not going to have a credible outside option, which means that the employer can suppress their wages um, without worrying that they're going to they're going to quit and work work for a competitor. So there's been a, a lot of recent empirical work trying to figure out how this you know how this plays out, and most of it suggests that non-competes do in fact suppress the wages of uh, lower income workers. But from a perspective of labor monopsony, this, this is a really serious problem. And one way to think about it, you know, if you think of all kinds of markets, for example, that are excessively concentrated like healthcare, what a hospital or other medical clinic could do is simply say to its doctors or nurses or technicians, you know, sign this non-compete, we'll give you a little extra money. They do so because it doesn't hurt them in any way. But what happens is if, if it's a kind of a rural or thinly populated area, an entrant cannot come and compete because all of the workers are already tied to the incumbent. The only way the an entrant could enter would be to somehow get everybody to understand that if they quit and wait a year or two, they can work for the incumbent and the incumbent will compensate them for this, you know, lost time, which is, you know, basically impossible. So I think non-competes probably have a, a pretty substantial impact on um, concentrating labor markets, uh, unfortunately. As I understand the uh, world of labor economics, uh, to which I'm a, a newcomer, until fairly recently, the assumption was that labor markets are relatively competitive in the sense that there are lots of employers competing for, for workers. There's a IO, an industrial organization casebook, I think from 2007 by Dennis Carlton, your colleague and a co-author, which flatly says that most labor markets are competitive. And he, uh, the only exception, they have like a box where they have an exception for the market and priests. And he says, well, the market and priests might be one market where there's a labor monopsony, but that's an exception. <laughs> now, uh, in around uh, 2016, 2017, a number of uh, mostly young uh, labor economists, I guess they got access to new sources of data, including Glassdoor, which is an online job matching platform. 
they, first of all, just looked at labor markets around the country. And it turns out that if you're just, you know, sort of counting up number of employers who are hiring a various type of a particular worker in a particular area, usually a commuting zone, there are lots of highly concentrated labor markets, extremely concentrated labor markets. In fact, far more concentrated in many cases than, you know, even the worst product markets. And, and when you think about it for a moment, and, and this is what their data show, it's, it's actually not that surprising because a huge part of the country is rural, uh, small towns, you know, thinly populated. And they, those areas just can't support, you know, lots of, let's say, accounting firms. You know, often these areas have a couple of fast food places, a Walmart, and maybe, you know, a chicken processing plant or something like that. Now, these papers also show that wages are lower in the concentrated markets than in the competitive markets. And, you know, there's a big question of causation here. Is this just correlation? Is it just that uh, bigger companies are, are more efficient and so they can employ workers more productively? Or is it monopsony? And so I think these earlier papers, you know, they tried to address this issue. One of them, for example, looked at mergers and, um, you know, mergers would often cause, would cause concentration and, uh, and wages to go down afterwards. The merged entity pays less than the previous entities. As I understand it, one of the sort of more persuasive papers, which was published very recently in the American Economic Review by uh, Prager and Schmidt, um, is more persuasive on the issue of causation. That focuses on hospital mergers, and it compares um, hospital workers who are specialized, like nurses and pharmacists, with, har with uh, hospital workers who are not specialized, like cafeteria workers and custodial workers. And it finds that after mergers, the, uh, the wage increase of the specialized workers declines, like the traditional wage increases decline, whereas the wages of the unspecialized workers remain the same. So I think this is going to be more, this is a more persuasive paper. But, uh, you know, the empirical world is a, is a complicated one. For purposes of my book, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I have to, you know, assume that, uh, that concentration, you know, inevitably causes a great, uh, huge reductions in wages. What I take from this empirical literature is, first of all, that concentration is ubiquitous and in a way that antitrust law has traditionally uh, been concerned and, uh, and that there's you know, reasonable evidence that concentration also uh, produces lower wages. I found that this presumption that labor markets were competitive to be so interesting because I always think it's fascinating when there are things we completely take for granted that turn out to be completely wrong, right? <laughs> yeah. I think that part of what has generated so much interest in this topic is that we have observed labor share value added has significantly dropped in the United States in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And so people have been uh, working hard to try to figure out what drives this phenomenon. And when I say I'm paying my workers less their marginal productivity, means that I implicitly leave some money on the table not to increase the salary of my existing workers. So imagine I have a bakery, okay? And I employ two people. On each one of them, I make twice as much as they are paid. So I make a bundle of them. However, I don't hire the third person because I'm so afraid that by hiring the third person, I will increase the wages of the two other bakers I have that uh, it doesn't pay off. When you put it in these terms, it's very hard to believe that's the case, no? But, but the, I mean, the premise is that you have to pay the workers the same amount, right? Just the way in product markets, we wouldn't, from an efficiency perspective, we wouldn't care if monopolists exist. They'd all engage in perfect price discrimination. The labor market uh, setting is just the same thing in the mirror. The, the employers, the assumption again is that they can't wage discriminate. They're paying all their bakers, you know, $10 an hour when they're producing $20 in value. If they want to attract additional bakers to sell more rolls and, and loaves of bread, they're going to have to um, offer a higher wage to the new people to attract them from some other industry or whatever. But if they do that, they're going to have to raise the wages for everybody else. So that's a big loss on the inframarginal workers. And, you know, bakers rationally don't want, don't want to do that. So I think the logic is very powerful. You know, you could, this is also, you know, it's been like it's conventional wisdom in economics for 200 years that it's rational for, um, for either sellers or employers or other big buyers to, um, you know, produce an inefficiently low level of output. So, uh, and the evidence seems to be consistent with that. So I'm comfortable with this uh, story.
No, but when it comes to the, the product market, the reason why you want to restrain your supply in order to extract higher prices is because you understand you're facing a very inelastic demand, okay? The same is true in the monopsony case. It must be true that you think that your supply for labor is very inelastic. Now, if it's very specialized labor, so if you're trying to hire a top uh, surgeon in the city of Chicago, maybe you think that there, there are limited supply. But if I try to hire, uh, maybe there is some skill in the baker, uh, but uh, if I hire a basic construction worker or a basic uh, manufacturer worker, is it really that the supply of this is so inelastic? That, that's the part that I find it uh, I difficult see. to... Yeah. I see. Okay, so uh, a couple points. I mean, you may be right, right? If, that, if you're right, then... Our, cons- our antitrust concern should be focused on higher skill workers, okay, if you're right. I don't think you're right, though, uh, for a couple reasons. There, there are some papers which try to look at this issue directly, and they find low elasticities, surprisingly low e- elasticities for unskilled workers. In fact, there's one paper that looks at Amazon Turk workers, you know, the people on Amazon Turk who, you know, they just get sort of random questions and things, and they get paid by the, you know, by the answer a couple cents. And some authors um, ran an experiment where they offered, you know, different wages or prices to these people, and they just didn't respond to the higher prices as you would expect if they were behaving in a, you know, purely rational way. Now, why is that? I think there are a lot more frictions, sort of natural frictions, that seem to me quite intuitive, even if, you know, I think people trained in economics, you know, may be indoctrinated not, 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 not to. But if you think, for example, of a fast food worker, there's actually an article in the Washington Post recently about these, I think they were McDonald's workers, who sort of quit en masse because they were being treated badly. They were friends with each other. You know, there was a Burger King that, they, that some of them could have gone to, but they didn't want to leave their friends at this particular McDonald's. They had relationships. They worked together all the time. After work, they would go to a coffee shop together. Like, so these sort of relationships can cause uh, significant frictions. In the uh, Daylands case that you mentioned at the beginning, Luigi, the... Uh, Plaintiff who ended up, I think, again, it was Home Depot. No, it was Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is totally different from McDonald's. I mean, unskilled in both cases, but there's a difference between working in a kitchen. Uh, This was also, by the way, in the Washington Post story. In the kitchen, there's a lot of camaraderie. People are interacting with each other. Um, In the Washington Post story, one person left the McDonald's, ended up at a mill. At the mill, you just kind of sit there and you lift boards all the time. It's totally different. So what might seem to us, you know, from our lofty position in the ivory tower is identical jobs uh, turn out to be, from the standpoint of the people who actually take them, quite different from each other. For sure, I would protest the argument that a baker is unskilled labor. Um, (laughs) Baking is incredibly skilled. American bakers are. (laughs) (laughs) There's another story for retail. I think the, you know, the growth of Walmart and Amazon and so forth, you know, they're opening up new warehouses in stagnant areas. And they, at least initially, offer higher wages. um, So that benefits workers. Now, one thing to watch is that as their competitors go out of business, you know, are they going to take the opportunity of, of reducing wage growth or reducing workers or making conditions worse while maintaining the wage? But uh, I, I do think the retail side of it may be, may be more complicated. That's actually a, a fascinating um, dystopian version of the future where Amazon controls <laughs> all our lives and starts making conditions for workers worse, lowering wages while raising prices for all of us. Don't let them take over. Um, anyway, I'll do my best. But, but, but I, like, I like the idea that the answer to this issue is complicated and multifaceted and that all these things interact in ways that we don't, no one fully understands yet. Another book. Uh, for someone else to write. So what are your solutions for that? My focus is antitrust law because I teach and write in that area. I, I don't think it's, the, you know, I don't think it's the ultimate solution. I, you know, I, part from my standpoint as a, as a law professor who's interested in antitrust law, I think antitrust law can be part of the solution, but it can't be the complete solution. One of the reasons why it can't be the complete solution is I think a big part of wage suppression is, is the result of search costs and other frictions like that as opposed to concentration. So antitrust law cannot really handle a problem like high search costs. It's just not something, you know, you can't sue a firm because search costs are high. So, you know, the best it can do is, is help reduce the, uh, the, the level of concentration. Outside of antitrust law, 
you know, I, I'm not an expert on labor, on unions, for example, that, you know, when, when I was growing up, you know, what I always heard was that unions actually raise wages above product, marginal product, that um, they cause rigidities and they end up harming workers. I, I gather the research is a lot more complicated than that. You know, to the extent unions are part of the solution, then the obvious public policy uh, response is to strengthen labor law. Um, labor law, which you know supports unions traditionally, has been weakened you know dramatically over the last many decades, and employers have become much more sophisticated about res- resisting union campaigns. So the the way to you know strengthen unions would probably require legal reform that uh, basically made it easier for workers uh, to organize. Um, there's another area of law which lawyers sort of g- call generically employment law. Those are like minimum wage laws and maximum hour laws and, you know, laws that, you know, restrict various types of labor market abuses. My guess is that the impact of those can be at best marginal. It's hard, it's hard to imagine a traditional, mar- uh, for example, minimum wage law having a major impact on labor markets. It can help people at the very bottom or maybe not quite the very bottom. It doesn't help people at the very bottom who, don't, who can't get jobs. But, you know, there could be more sophisticated versions of minimum wage laws like wage boards where you would have different minimum wages for different industries People are beginning to do research on wage boards, which exist in other countries and and actually a little bit in the United States. And I'd be curious how well they actually work. But of course, you know, there are all kinds of dangers with having, you know, the government involved in setting wages, just like uh, prices. Uh, So, you know, those are the solutions that are are on the table. You know, there are are other sort of general solutions like, you know, greater uh, transfers for workers and so forth training and all that stuff. I, you know, I just don't know how effective those types of uh, policy responses are, but people should be thinking about them. Okay. Thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, my pleasure. Th- thank you. Bye-bye. So let me try to explain in simple words what these two students, uh, one is actually coming out of MIT and one is coming out of Chicago, describe. And, and what I find fascinating is that they use completely different techniques and they arrive at a very similar results, which is actually quite strange in economics because they, they tend to go in the opposite direction. Really? So That's interesting in and of itself, actually, <laughs> that if you use a different methodology, you get to a different answer. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Go on. So let me start with actually uh, the MIT student. Uh, his name is Brian uh, Sigmiller. He used the idea that imagine you are a firm and you have a shock idiosyncratic shock. So imagine you have Zoom technology and you are at the beginning of the pandemic. Your stock price goes to the roof, even controlling for whatever everybody else is doing. When your stock price is going to the roof, suggest that you have something special that is valuable and you want to invest more. You want to invest more in capital. You want to invest more in labor. So if I'm Zoom technology and we are at the beginning of a pandemic, I should hire like crazy, right? What he shows is actually firms don't do that very much. They're not that responsive. And in jargon, the elasticity of their the, the supply of labor they face is not that high. Couldn't a problem be that the measurement of a jump in a stock price, couldn't that be an artificial measurement in and of itself, particularly in today's market where companies have irrational jumps in their stock prices for all sorts of reasons that don't necessarily signify more demand for their products? The market today, if it ever were rational, and it, it is not. So maybe corporate managers are responding quite responsibly in the face of an unreliable signal. Uh, it's a very good question. First of all, we're not looking at the aggregate stock prices. So the aggregate stock prices can be crazy. Uh, What he's looking at is the idiosyncratic, which of course could be due to a lot of other things, including potentially the manager manipulating the stock prices, but... You hope that Elon Musk isn't rushing out to hire 100,000 more engineers for Tesla because it added however many billions to its market cap on the fake announcement of a fake deal with Hertz. (laughs) That's right. Anyway... (laughs) Yeah, but actually Tesla is a good example because uh, there is something in the fact that uh, Tesla is going to the roof. And you can say it's all manipulation, but I don't believe. I think there is a fundamental and actually a Tesla is a platform on wheels, a digital platform of wheels, because they have so much data that they look very much like uh, the new Google just for cars, not for, for the rest. And so Actually, he's hiring engineers like crazy. And the question is, what is the elasticity of, uh, of uh, the supply of engineers to Tesla? Now, the other thing that he finds that is uh, kind of intriguing is that the most productive firms 
face lower supplies of elasticity on average and even lower for skilled workers. So Tesla is the ideal example. I don't, I don't know what is in the sample, but that is the ideal example because it is a very high productivity firm with uh, demand for high skilled workers. So they should have a very high elasticity. In fact, they have a very low elasticity. What he estimates is that firms at the bottom of the labor productivity range pay uh, 94% of the marginal product to their workers. So they pay what, at least in economic, we say is the right amount. But firms that are in the top end up paying only 62% of their marginal product. So a little bit more than half what they are it seems to imply that the more the more successful and prominent a firm is, the more control it has in the labor market, right? Those would be that last set of numbers that you read off about the more the the, the more prominent firms or the more successful firms having even less elasticity in their in their in their prices. Yeah, I, I will dispute only the the use that you have of uh, control over the labor market because. Uh, what my understanding, and I think that this is helpful for, for our listener, is not that you are literally a monopsonist, you are the only buyer, is the fact that you are sensitive enough to the fact that if you keep hiring, you're going to change prices. Traditionally, we thought that was the case for, for labor market, that if you increase the demand for bakers, it's not going to increase the price of bakers by a lot. The moment you understand that your demand for bakers, not, not the aggregate demand, but your demand for bakers, increase the, the, the price of bakers, then you are going to shed your demand. That's kind of a natural thing that people would do. The answer is yes, that more productive firms are more subject to this impact on prices, and so they shed their demand more, which, by the way, should impact more highly sophisticated people, highly trained people like engineers, et cetera, rather than the ordinary workers. But so that, that's a different story, but that's kind of uh, the result. The other, the other student, uh, his name is James Trainer, and he's a student of mine, uh, uses a, a, a very clever but complex idea of saying, I want to assume only that firms minimize cost. So they, they, they don't even profit maximize, just minimize cost. The only way you can explain the way in which manufacturing firms use workers is if they shed their demand because they expect to have an impact on prices. What is fascinating is he finds this effect to be non-existent in 1972. By 2014, the labor wedge is, is huge. In fact, is equal to 50%. So that the firms tend to pay 50% of what the marginal productivity of labor is. So 62% in one case, 50% in the other, starting from completely different points of view, is quite fascinating. Now, what they don't fully explain, neither paper actually does, is why that's the case. Eric's uh, line, which is market are uh, concentrated, and labor market are concentrated, I'm not so sure it, it holds so much because it's very much a function of how segmented markets are. For very specialized labor, this is uh, clearly the case. The markets are concentrated. The, the important question, in my view, is, is this a phenomenon just limited to highly specialized labor? So the, the bigger question is whether this applies to the people who are really hurting in the last 30 years, so the median workers. The median workers is, does not have a college degree. The media worker is not that specialized, even if Eric told us that there is an important specialization of being a McDonald versus being a uh, Hobby Lobby. And the paper by Traina and Kirov is, is important in my view because it focuses on manufacturing. So it, it talks mostly about uh, those kind of workers and not academic economists. Great. It does seem to me that in our discussion with Eric, it seemed to me that it was perhaps dangerous to conflate the, these two things, which are what affects really highly skilled workers versus what affects where the real issue is, which is the decline in wages among the middle class and the bottom of the socioeconomic la ladder. And those are the issues that we as a society are grappling with. And so when you conflate them into one issue that involves tech workers and investment bankers and manufacturing jobs, what would be the right, the opposite of the 
mountain, mistaking the mountain for the molehill. It would be, it would, it would, it would, it would be, it would be jumbling everything into one big cake in which you can't possibly separate out the different, the different ingredients. So there are two separate questions in my mind because he is so clear about not wanting his work to be used as a, as an explanation for wage stagnation, which is there's this antitrust thing over here, which is this issue. And it's, and it's a big issue, how we've come to define antitrust. Have we defined it in too narrow a way? And should we think of antitrust much more broadly than the consumer welfare statute that we've applied for all these decades? And I think Eric's book is really interesting on that point. And the answer is yes, there are lots of different ways to think about antitrust and we should have a more multifaceted approach to it. And then there's this issue of wage stagnation, which may or may not encompass his argument, but is this big, huge social and economic and question um, that that I think is key to the future of our country and key to the future of capitalism. So, but I'm not sure they're the same. They're the same issue. I agree, but I find it very intellectually honest of Eric to uh, recognize that what he's saying is not necessarily implying the other, because uh, there's a huge uh, economic payoff in claiming that he has addressed that issue. So if he wanted to maximize the sales of his book or, or his own reputation, he could claim that. But he's not because I think his book does not deliver on that margin. Uh, the book is, in my view, extremely interesting in, number one, documenting this hole in the antitrust and also the historical origin of this hole. Uh, unions kind of hate antitrust because initially antitrust was used against union. And also... In the book, he explains a number of incentives why it's so difficult to bring cases of labor antitrust versus to bring cases of product market antitrust. And, and even in the product market, we think antitrust has not been particularly effective, so let alone in, in the labor case. So, so the book delivers very much on this margin. He wrote the book very early on in this kind of uh, collective research where there wasn't a lot of research that could link the global uh, uh, slowdown in wages to the antitrust phenomenon. I think this papers on the market this year seems to start to draw that connection. However, until we find a, a fully satisfactory mechanism, uh, I think we cannot say that we nail it. We know that in the United States, mobility has gone down. This decreased level of mobility makes people more subject to local market power. After all, the, the only remedy to company towns were your ability to move to a different town, which of course comes at a cost. I'm not saying that, but if people cannot move, then they are much more subject to market power at the local level. If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I are having on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should also check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories. It's not told through opinions and anecdotes, but rather through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. So if you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago podcast network. I was thinking about on the subject of manufacturing. I think it would be really interesting if somebody did a paper breaking this down between publicly traded companies and private ones, because I wonder if that's part of the dynamic that has taken place in that a public company is scrutinized on every metric so closely that for them to have their cost of goods sold go up, even if they grew, might be a bad thing um, in the eyes of Wall Street because it would cause them to miss earnings estimates. It would cause the analyst models to be wrong. And if this very desire to please the stock market, particularly on a short-term basis, has also something to do with the decisions that firms make around, around hiring more employers, in other words, it, uh, hire more employees. In other words, if you're going to grow, even though ostensibly that would would be good. But if you're going to grow and it's going to cause your margins to go down, that might actually not be good for your stock price. If I had planted a question to promote my students, I could not have done better because he has another paper, a very short one, on the profit puzzle because he shows that actually the profitability of publicly traded firm has not gone up so much in recent years. The one of privately held firms much more. So he has not been able yet to link the manufacturing data to, uh, to the publicly traded firm yet. But the presumption is the opposite of what you assume, that actually the people that pay the workers the least are privately held firms. So this is consistent to your view of a private equity as evil, because uh, private equity firms can get away with paying workers very little. 
publicly traded companies much less so. And he conjectures this is maybe because of visibility, because imagine if Ford were to pay workers very little, there will be a lot of discussion. And we see with Amazon how much sort of uh, discussion there is in the paper about how much they pay their workers. There isn't the, uh, the same amount of analysis of Cargill that is a large uh, privately held company. That's fascinating. And that is, that is, that is not what, what, I, what, what I would have expected. I just can't help but believe in my journalistic, um, non-scientific way that the pressure on companies to meet earnings estimates and to deliver on profitability targets has got to play into this somehow or another, that it has to be yet another factor. But I also wanted to go to what you said on, on mobility because that gets at an issue as to why this may be always a difficult topic to capture with, with a model. Because at least what I have seen of labor markets, I grew up in a small town in northern Minnesota where the only industry there really was iron mining. Um, there is no way people were going to leave that, that town to go do anything else because of family, long-standing family ties there. So you might be able to say that that, that, that unskilled mining labor should have a uh, uh, should have a bigger market than northern Minnesota but the reality is just based on people's lives that it that it that it that it didn't yeah I think that uh, guilty as charged we economists always want to have one explanation for everything and probably there is more than one however what is fascinating is how widespread this phenomenon is if it was limited to mining, in small towns, then um, okay, so the idiosyncratic factor, but is not limited to that, is widespread in manufacturing, is widespread in services, and uh, is widespread also in constructions. Unfortunately, in all these sectors, there seem to be no pricing power of labor and a, a dramatic uh, uh, stagnation of wages. So our lovely producer, Matt, had a question he wanted us to answer, which is, would it make the market more competitive if all wage information had to be publicly available, if every company everywhere, every employer everywhere had to uh, post their had to post their, their their salary information? You know, it's interesting. There's a microcosm of that in law firms where some law firms um, divulge exactly what people are paid and exactly why it is and have believe in total transparency and other law firms do not. And I don't think even within the legal profession, there's agreement on which is the better way to do things. Um, but of course, that's for the lawyers themselves, not for those of us in the rest of the world. <laughs> so maybe there, maybe there's a different argument that applies to the benefit of the society versus the benefit of very competitive lawyers in a firm realizing that they don't make as much as Mr. or Mrs. whatever in the office next door. Anyway, Luigi, your thoughts? Let, let me divide uh, the economist's response and the psychologist's response. Uh, so I would play the I'm sure psychologist. As an economist, actually, there is a pretty clear answer that says that if a firm has market power, allowing the firm to price discriminate, which is to basically price differently different workers, reduces the inefficiency of monopoly or monopsony. So if you publicize the wages, you make it impossible for a firm not to pay everybody the same salary or the impossible is too strong. You make it very difficult. And so paradoxically, you are exacerbating the effect of monopsony because uh, in order to hire an extra worker, I have to pay all my workers more. And so I prefer not to hire an extra worker. And so I do have a, a, a negative impact. This is ignoring, the, the, like economists do, the distributional issue. So I'm not saying that the workers are going to be better off, but there will be more workers employed. So if you are concerned about, for example, employment, allowing price discrimination makes uh, employment easier. Now, this is uh, what economists say. That there is, of course, a very important psychological factor. I always tell a story that, you know, in, among academics, uh, salary are secret. So you don't know what uh, your colleagues do. But... Academics are super competitive with each other. And so when we got into the new building, this was more than 10 years ago at Chicago, we had to run a lottery in order to allocate the offices because uh, academics over infer from the difference in uh, offices, the difference in status. And I have a very esteemed coll colleague who went to another colleague saying, I hate you because he had a bigger office. So uh, I thought it was a bit of an excessive thing that you went to that extreme. But that's to say that for a few square inches more, because the offices are all gorgeous, and so it's really a few square inches more in one office to the other, uh, people are willing to say to their colleagues, I hate you. Imagine for a few <laughs> penny more what they would do. Although maybe if they knew what the few pennies more were, they wouldn't be so tied up in what the office signifies, right? It may be, it, it may be that the latter stands in for the, um, for, 
it for the former. I was thinking when you were talking about a friend of mine whose firm did a big reorganization where people lost their jobs and lost their roles. And he came to believe it was all because they were moving into new office space and it was all a competition for who was going to get the, 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 the best offices. And so I, I think often um, office real estate or other things stand in for the kind of transparency that people don't have about who's making what. It becomes a signifier of who's important in a world where we don't know that information. And so maybe if we knew that information, you wouldn't want to kill somebody over their office space. I don't know. (laughs) And now we're going to do Capital Is or Capital Isn't, the part of the show where we discuss something that's happened in the news and decide whether it's a capital is or a capital isn't. And Luigi and I get to have an argument, we hope. Now, is this a show, speaking of? Isn't it a show? We're not showing anything. It's a show. A podcast is a show, isn't it? Okay. After all, we have capitalists without capital and a show without showing. It's perfect. It's perfect. Anyway, so this week we thought we'd talk about Zillow. Zillow announced it plans to take write-downs of as much as $569 million and is slashing its workforce by 25%. After failures at its iBuying program, the company says it's going to be winding down that segment of the business that had been trying to buy and flip houses. So the recent announcement by Zillow that it would close this business called Zillow Offers, which was essentially an algorithm-based home flipping outfit, is one of, as the Wall Street Journal called it, the sharpest recent American corporate retreat. We went into the business as a big swing um, on the bet that we could actually predict the price of a home six months into the future. This business was responsible for a majority of Zillow's revenue, but none of its profits, and its write-down was more than a half a billion dollars. And Luigi, you said you had strong opinions on Zillow, so I'm going to let you start. Yes. Actually, by accident, I listened to a paper that was presented at the last meeting of the National Bureau of Economic Research that were discussing another of this uh, iBuyer. I see companies that are trying to buy and sell uh, houses in the, in the market uh, using some algorithm. One of the things that emerged from that paper very clearly is that it's very dangerous to do that, especially if you are Zillow and you publish your quotes, because uh, people have some information, local information about stuff that you cannot price very well in your algorithm. And so they will only sell you houses that are worth less than your algorithm and only buy houses that are more expensive than your algorithm. And so you end up on average uh, facing what is called in jargon adverse selection that is very costly. And this is even under the best situation where you have a very fluid market and your inventory cost is not going to be very large. So what is amazing of Zillow is was succeeding in losing $320 million, millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in a market that is growing. Generally, in, in a market that is dropping, you face also losses on your inventory. But in this case, Zillow should make money on the inventory and, in spite of that, lost uh, hundreds of millions. So I suppose in many ways that would make it a capital isn't. If you manage to lose money in the housing market at a time when the housing market is going up, then that is definitely the destruction of capital. And in that sense, I guess it's a, it's, it's a capital isn't. I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm still puzzling through the capital is or capital isn't issue. And I think that's because I'm distracted by another component of the Zillow story, which to me is the human is or human isn't part of it. And what I mean by that is that I worry a lot that AI, artificial intelligence is coming a lot more quickly than we're going to than we are ready for it. And I'm always relieved and encouraged by examples of algorithms failing and failing badly and showing that there is something to the world that an algorithm still can't quite capture. I remember sitting at a Vanity Fair conference a couple of years ago and the CEO, um, the head of HBO and the head of Instagram were on stage and someone asked them, why does something go viral? What makes something go viral? And they both said, damned if we know. We don't We don't have any idea. We, we can't figure this out. And so from Netflix trying to build a um, machine that would be able to predict people's taste, to Amazon being able to recommend books that you're going to like, to Zillow's algorithm failing to enable it to make money on this on this home flipping machine. I'm, I'm actually relieved that there are things yet that we haven't figured out how to measure, that there's some sort of human intelligence that still escapes artificial intelligence. So in that standpoint, I'm very much pro Zillow's fa- failure. I'm, I'm relieved by it and happy, and happy about it, even if they lost a great deal of money. And I don't mean to be rooting for the destruction of capital, but in this case, I am. I agree with you. If uh, the specific story is an example of failure, 
you can see is also an example of success of capitalists in the sense that the CEO, who was uh, very successful in the past, had to revert his decision pretty fast in face of the losses. In a system where you don't have uh, the quarterly earnings and the pressure of the stock price, they would have continued operating for years before finding out the damage. So in uh, capitalism does not uh, promise no mistakes. Nobody can. But promises to correct a mistake faster than uh, most other systems or probably all other systems. So, so in that sense is a capitalism. I love this concept that something that has destroyed a lot of money can still be an example of how capitalism should should work. And I think I think I think that's right. I I think they tried to create something new, they failed, they failed badly, and that's how the system is and they admitted it and that's how the system is supposed to work. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't wherever you get your podcasts. Capital Isn't.